Welcome back to Enthador, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Marcus Aurelius, and this is Dwarf Fortress version 0.43, and we are the Undersea Library of Lost Knowledge. And we've had it rough. We've had it pretty rough these past couple of years. We've had to face starvation, near constant goblin sieges, and also, when we're not under siege, merchants will arrive, and they'll get right up to our doorstep, and for reasons that I cannot place or understand, they turn around. Now, in Forest Home, we posited that the reason they were doing that was because there were brawls going on in the tavern, which was right next to the trade depot, and that somehow scared the merchants and sent them running. Now I have no such excuse. I honestly, at this point, truly believe it's a bug in the game somewhere. Because the wagons show up, they happily march up all the way to our fortress's front door, they get there, and then they turn around and flee off the screen for no reason that I can tell. Except, except the elves. And I know it is popular. It is trendy in some circles, and Dwarf Fortress just constantly bash the elves. But I have to say right now that if it were not for our pointy-eared little friends, Lost Knowledge would not exist. They ran the goblin blockade. They came straight in to our trade depot, and they not only traded us humongous amounts of plants, but also a ton of animals, which, as soon as they left, you know, because we didn't want to offend them, we uh, butchered all of them. <laughs> so we now have plenty of food and a fair amount of drink. So that is great. What's not great is we were just attacked by the were-rabbit Emo Norgiris Shacklinalok, a large rabbit twisted into humanoid form. It is crazed for blood and flesh. Its eyes glow lime. Its cinnamon hair is long and straight. Now you will know why you fear the night. And we have so, so much to fear right now, folks, because half our fortress, it seems like, is outside right now, for one reason or another. Including what looks like... Oh, okay, I thought Gregor Stoneside was our mayor for Onyx Onyxblade, because he has the mayor sprite to him. But we're in some serious trouble, and here's why. Let's just say he kills a couple people and then leaves. We won't be able to tell without like painstaking, painstaking research and reading the notes if he actually bit anyone who survived. Meaning any one of our dwarves who even survives this attack could theoretically be infected. Bad news number two, he appears right here, right outside of our front door. He could have appeared far, far in the distance, giving us time to shut the doors, but he did not. So I'm going to have to pull an emergency here. I'm not even going to try to close the front door. Actually, I might, just because we might trap him in there. But I'm actually going to close the front door. Well, first of all, let's try to get everybody inside, but not many of them are going to make it, I'm sorry to say. We're going to lose a bunch of dwarves in this fortress that already has lost so much. All right, so that's set. So now we have to go to our doors and I guess just shut them all. Pull. Pull. Because the problem with Werebeast is it's not that they're strong. I mean, our military could take him down without question. It's that... If he manages to bite anyone, then they become a beast, and that's where things really get kind of iffy. So now that this is all set up, I am going to find our friend here amidst the corpses of our dwarves, and I'm going to follow him to pay real close attention to what he's up to. Capital F. All right, let's go. All right, so luckily he's not attacking our fortress. He's instead attacking our dwarves. He killed one. Killed another. Killed a third. All right, so let's quickly, let's quickly just figure out what's going on. So he attacked someone who got away. That being Gregor Stoneside. So we have to pay attention to that. So let's go to reports.
There it is. The soldier, Gregor Stoneside. Okay. Can it all end so quickly, says Gregor. This does not scare me. So it looks like right now the were-rabbit just keeps missing, Gregor. Actually, that seems like it. It seems like there was no hit whatsoever. There's only one page of news here. And it claims that Gregor was not actually bitten. Okay. So, that's great. This werebeast better turn back into a whatever it is soon. Usually it's a human. Or we're going to be in some real trouble. So who died? Let's first take a look at that. Lord Lucius. Naldreth. Vanguardus Black. Yeah, it just says Naldreth and Vanguard is black. So they haven't even found out about Lord Lucius yet. Naldreth, Lord Lucius, and Vanguard is black. So those three are dead. Those three are dead. No question. It appears that Gregor Stoneside made it out without a scratch. And now we just have to watch what happens. Let's First, let's go down and see if our dwarves actually managed to shut the gate. They did. And what's, what's wrong with you people? Gregory Shelbourne. I guess he's just sick. Like, he's uh, sick because of... Yeah, he's dizzy and nauseous. Look at all this green here. I mean, this is nothing new to you folks. Anybody who watches my Let's Plays are quite aware that the streets are literally often paved with vomit. <laughs> but there we have it. So they all made it inside, all these guys. Very great. Doesn't look like anyone is trapped. But there are some still people outside, of course. Gregor, right there. There's also... Kylern. And then down here we have... Doothug. You know, it's actually a good thing they're all sick. Because that, the blinking X is the only reason I'm even able to... to locate them amidst all the chaos here. And it appears that... I felt like there was hundreds of people out there, but it looks like, except for those two and the three that already died, everyone seems to have made it. I know, you look at this mess. I mean, there's just corpses everywhere, bones everywhere, bolts everywhere. And that doesn't help things that there's uh, rush flowers apparently growing everywhere, which really kind of cloud the image here. All right, so let's see what he does. All right, he's heading south. And he just killed our friend Kylern. So now what do we have here? Okay, this guy down here, he better run fast. He appears to just be happy, standing and gloating over the corpse of Kylern. Maybe he's eating him. I don't know. He just destroyed our butcher shop. And oh no. It appears that Gregor Stoneside... Didn't survive after all. Oh! Oh, he turned back into a human. He turned back into a human. Alright, let's see. The were-rabbit kicks the soldier. Strikes the soldier. Strikes the soldier. Strikes the soldier. Strikes, 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 strikes. Strikes. Strikes, 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 strikes. <laughs> strikes, 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 and strikes. So basically the were-rabbit is just beating the shit out of him with a cave spider silk dress. So somehow this were-beast, this were-rabbit, is so strong that even with a silk dress, he is able to not only kill four of our dwarves, but also just beat the living tar out of Gregor Stoneside, who happens to be a female, to the point where she's vomiting and retching and just not doing very well. Basically bruising the muscle quite a bit, but it doesn't appear, at least that I could see here, 
it does not appear that Gregor was bit. Just just hit a bunch. And from what I understand, the werebeast has to bite. Now the werebeast He did kick the soldier in the right eye with his left paw, and the injured part collapses. So like he just kicked her in the face and her eye exploded. That's not very pretty, but it doesn't look like that can cause that can cause uh, someone to turn into a werebeast. So there we go. Not sure what to do here. I guess the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get our people back to inactive. Then we're going to go down to our... I'll just do the quick way here. Go down to our um, doors and open all of them. I'm pretty sure that Gregor is safe. Pretty sure. There doesn't appear to be any... I mean, I can't really... I wish there was a keyword search or something I look for bite. But again, strike, strike, kick, strike, 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 strike. strike. Yeah. The soldier looks even more sick. Honestly, it would have been better if she died. Because we're always going to have to wonder... I don't understand. It's so funny, too, because there was all this missing. Just constant missing. Like, Gregor was having no trouble avoiding it, and then all of a sudden, she never misses after that. Once that first hit gets in with the left upper arm, with the dress, that was it for Gregor. She couldn't avoid any other hits. I must withdraw. I have improved my miscellaneous object. That was very satisfying. <laughs> All right, so it looks like we're fine. It really looks like we're fine. I don't think Gregor is a problem. I'm just looking to see here what he did to other people. Yeah, here we go. The were-rabbit bites the unassigned in the head, tearing apart the muscle through the giant cave spider silk hood. So the were-rabbit definitely bites people. It definitely bit whomever that unassigned was. Kylern, I guess. Yeah, Kylern. So it was biting the hell out of Kylern, but not... Okay. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to go with this. It appears that Gregor's okay. I mean aside from being severely injured. Where where are you going, Gregor? What's what's your deal? Yeah, look at this. Perfect health. No wounds anywhere. Just dizzy and and nauseous. I think. How do I do you Plus to get down. There we go. Yeah, nothing. Nothing, huh? So let's let's take a closer look. Oh, wow! Four notable kills and twenty-five other kills. Gregor, why are you not in our military? You seem to be someone who should. Let's do a quick search here. Gregor Stoneside. I have. Gregor set as soldier, which implies military. Yes, a master sword. Maybe that's why, because we don't really need any swords dwarves in our military at this moment. But Gregor is amazing. It's too, I mean, maybe we should just teach her how to use a hammer. Probably wouldn't take that long. And she has all these other skills already. Like, look at her dodging, her shield using. All these skills are incredibly good. Expert fighter. Maybe that's why Gregor didn't get bit. I don't know. But it does seem like a stroke of luck. She is uneasy after a lack of decent meals. She feels lonely after being away from friends. Bored after being unable to practice a craft. Bored after being unable to practice a martial art. A lot of our guys, I've noticed, are bored and lonely. I mean, it's, I guess that's what you do when you're bored and lonely. You say, hey, let's go to this uh, new fortress on the edge of an evil sea that drips horrific goo and is constantly under siege from goblins. That sounds like a good time. However, despite being bored and lonely, and seeing more death than your average World War II soldier, she doesn't have any wounds. That I could see. And she's married to Garment. And she does have a child, Edzul, oily-focused. 
She's 70 years old. Yeah, unbelievably strong. Basically unbreakable, indefatigable, and agile. So really, if we had to have someone take the hit and have to fight off this were-rabbit, she is definitely, definitely the one. Yeah. Okay. I think she's alright. I'm gonna let her in the fortress. Actually, I'm gonna teach you all a secret right now. It's a, it's cheating. But in Dwarf Therapist, you can tell if someone is uh, a creature of the night. Again, cheating. But uh, it works. All right, see here? Highlight Cursed Dwarves. I actually have it checked. We haven't had one at all. Like, we haven't had one vampire in this entire fortress. I guess. I mean, I'm assuming because I don't... I never saw anybody purple colored. But my guess is if Gregor was turned and bitten, she would be purple colored. Although maybe the game is smarter than I am and keeps her looking normal until she turns into Werebeast. That would be something. A lot of red here. Why is there so much red? Oh, our military. Probably because they're... Yeah, missing. Metal gauntlet. Metal gauntlet. Leather mitten. Leather mitten. Metal high boot. Metal high boot. Sock. Yo, you can't read this. It's right off the uh, the part I'm recording. But yeah, sock, metal greaves, leather robe. Leather robe? Torvgan, we have like a thousand of those. I think what happened is he probably put on his armor first. Yeah, because they have uh, both the iron breastplate and the copper mail shirt. So my guess is they put the armor on first, and now they can't get the robe on underneath. Because the dwarves apparently... I mean, I could have sworn this was something that would have been a high priority to be fixed. But apparently they screw up all the time when putting their own clothes on. So I think she's alright. So now let's talk about... Actually, is this guy still here? Yeah, he's... Is that... No, that's one of our guys. Where is this human? Where is this... This piece of crap here that we need to murder... Emo. I'm sorry, I know you're friendly. Emo. That's a good name for a werewolf. Actually, a were-rabbit. Yeah, he is pretty emo. Um, There he is. I don't think we're going to get him. I have this feeling that he's going to get off, so I'm not going to... But that means he can come back. Interrupted by a human. Why? just a human. He's no longer a were-rabbit. He's just folks. Oh, Exasto apparently is still dead. Oh, yeah, we have a lot of new dead people now, actually. So let's quickly go over what has changed since the last episode of Lost Knowledge. Well, the library is up and running, and boy, did it take a lot of work. See, there's a limit to how big you can make a zone. It's actually quite small. As you can see here, this is one zone. This is two zones. This is three. So what I basically had to do, luckily with the new location system, is you can assign multiple zones to the same location. In the old versions of the game, you couldn't do that. So I had to... This library is actually made up of something like 12 zones. Four on each level. But they all tie together. So if you were to look at the Great Library, which is our name of it, you would see that it has 72 bookcases, 21 written objects, uh, and a 10 writing materials, though they desire 12. No tables, no chairs. We're going to work on that. And as I mentioned in a previous episode, Clued Burner is our scholar. And we can have more later. We'll probably have more. We'll probably need scholars and scribes of plenty. But right now, we're too busy trying to figure out how to stay alive. Either way, we are slowly filling this up with bookcases. But obviously, it's a tough business. I think I'm going to put all stone bookcases in the main rooms. And these little corner rooms here, I'm going to try to do metal bookcases if I can. So hopefully gold. Hopefully, we'll find enough gold that we're able to dig out that I can have uh, gold in bookcases. You might notice this up here. This strange little building. This is going to be our temple. So our civilization has... I believe nine gods. So this will have a little alcove, a little triangular alcove for seven gods, and then we'll have two kind of in the middle here. And that'll fit all nine statues to all nine gods of our pantheon, and this will be our great temple. 
it's only one story. But what I was thinking of doing... Now, here was my idea, but it, it doesn't work very well because the game doesn't do very well thinking in 3D. But I was going to dig out a whole lower level of all this and just have an altar. Or each of the statues, maybe, on an altar. But the problem with that is the game doesn't think very well in 3D when you're designating. So if I, for example, designated the statue as a uh, statue hall or whatever, it would only apply to the upper story and not the actual ground story. So I, I could do it still, or I could put the statues up on pedestals and then set just the ground as a temple, which obviously I'm going to have to do anyway, and it'll, you know, fake it to its best ability, but the statues themselves won't count as being part of that room. So unfortunately, unlike my magnificent everything else, my library and my three-story high dining hall, which by the way is now completely furnished, at least level one with stone stuff. I might have some gold or other metallic tables here because there's some empty space in the top and the bottom. I might fill with really nice tables. And then this section in the middle is for prepared food. And let's go down to the project. And we're slowly but surely getting rid of the uh, boulders. And I have the water exit here. So this is a floodgate. So we're going to fill this room up pretty high. Like to as high as it will go. I mean, not, we're not going to do 7 of 7 or anything silly like that. But we'll fill it up to about 2. Just so I know that every single square has water on it. And then we're going to stop the water. And we are going to open the floodgate. And all the water is going to fall out. This is a fortification that's been carved into the side of the map. Water will fall out that. So... End result, it might take some time, but end result means the water will automatically drop to one, and at one, it can evaporate and then turn into soil. So it might take some time for all this to happen, and it'll definitely take a lot of time to fill up this gigantic room, but it will happen. Now, I mentioned I was thinking of making a bridge here and uh, having this do double duty, where when the bridge is down, the water fills this room, but when the bridge is up, it creates a hole that goes down somewhere else. I decided against it. One, because I've already spent more time on this fortress than Sand Pillar. And two, because I, I don't have any other ideas of what to do with water. So really, this is all I'm going to need the water for. And we have this methodology of getting it out. And then we're done. So there's really no need for me to, uh, to put anything here. I guess once the uh, the work is all done, I'll block this off with a, with a wall or something. And that's that. Well, now let me show you the... Okay, so I was really worried about this farm, which is so necessary for our life, to uh, be attacked by a forgotten beast. And I'm, I was also nervous because this cavern is really tall, so to build walls around it completely would be prohibitive. So what I did instead is I built one wall and then just a little ceiling on top of that. Because, right, if I were to build a wall up all the way to the roof of the cave, it would be really hard to do. So it's this tiny, tiny little darkened alcove with our three farms. and uh, But now it's completely safe from any type of beast forgotten or otherwise however now our dwarves don't have any access to the caverns but that seems okay to me in fact i'm not even that super interested in digging down to the magma because we've had plenty of wood so far and char we're, you know, we're doing just fine with charcoal i mean we might, we might still do it who knows but there you have it so some other things i want to discuss before the video is over bullzome has named an item. Let's see here. I want to say it's this one. Yep. It is Vood Thardaleth Ak Inab, or Ransack Polish the Finger of Meals, a silver warhammer with 19 kills. None notable, unfortunately, but 19 kills nonetheless, all done by Bullzome. So congratulations to Bullzome on that. We also have... I want to say this is new. Bombrek Libash or Whipped Axe, a diorite earring. And all craft swordship, of course, is of the highest quality. It is encrusted with round diorite cabochons studded with gold and encircled with bands of marquise-cut cat's eyes, rose-cut clear zircons, and almond wood. This object menaces with spikes of gold and clear zircon. On the item is an image of Nenton, Began Lancer, the dwarf, and Goso Lobster Hated the Goblin in Diorite. Goso is striking down Nenton. And that's relating to, of course, Goso actually striking down Nenton 
with a silver morning star in lost knowledge in the early summer of 172. On the item also is an image of forgotten beasts in cat's eye. So that's cool. And uh, one other thing, one other thing. Oh yes, right, right, right. Our memorial hall is now set up. So in honor of the fallen dwarves, of which now there are three more, let's take a look at that. So first, we have our first death, and that being Red Fairface. This is an exceptional diorite memorial to Red Fairface Avuz Ilun. The slab reads in memory of Red Fairface. Born 82, drowned in the year 167, militia commander of the Scribes of Destiny, 166 to 167. May you always be remembered. I had to do this because the dwarves started possessing people and causing them to uh, fight each other. I didn't know they could do that. That was actually, I was amazed that there was still something this game could do to su um, surprise me, but it did. Now this is an exceptional diorite memorial to Cavan Metalbasher. The slab reads, in memory of Cavan, born 36, succumbed to infection, slain by the dwarf Duthug Trade Knife in the year 171. Devoted father and husband, lover of the diamonds of gold. Which is a sting song, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Next, we have an exceptional diorite memorial to Henzi. The slab reads, in memory of Henzi, born 94, died of thirst in the year 172. Uh, this is because Henzi was trying to create the artifact Lanced Bulbous, but was unable to do so. And this is happening as well. Arturus, unfortunately, went crazy. And I'm really getting annoyed by this. I, I believe it's a bug, because I looked at everything he wanted. He wanted cloth thread, bones, wood, metal bars, uncut gems, and stone. And I had all of those things. And even if he didn't actually want cloth thread, I had silk thread, I had yarn, so there was no item that I did not have. So it either, it must have been something with because I have multiple stockpiles and how one stockpile feeds into another and then some stockpiles are set to be multiple items. So I noticed the game one time in the past, maybe it was Forest Home, I don't know, but it got confused. It said I didn't have something that I really did have and all I had to do was create a new stockpile, one square only, just for that type of thing. And the dwarf, some random dwarf pulled it out of the original stockpile put it in that new one, and then the, the dwarf with the mood went straight for it. So I think moods sometimes get messed up by stockpile designations is what I'm trying to say. Either way, I didn't do that this time, and Arcturus is now insanely wandering the halls, muttering and tearing off his clothes. But back to Henzi. Henzi apparently was a lover of tables. And who isn't? I, I love a good table. Then we have... An exceptional granite memorial to Dead Awesome. The slab reads, in memory of Dead Awesome, born 85, struck down by the goblin Estruor, scourge clinched with an iron flail in Utu Tuxu, the onslaught of barbs in the year 172. A devoted wife, the color light blue made her happy. This is a masterful diorite memorial to Dullinwen, created by Wuthart. The slab reads, in memory of Dullinwen, born 116, bled to death, slain by the goblin Nako Devil Jaundice with a copper pike in Utu Thuksu, the onslaught of barbs. Devoted mother and wife. Oh, she was also the creator of Decline Saber, the slick craft. And she was united with steel, like a true dwarf. Next, we have an exceptional diorite memorial to Stroud. In memory of Stroud, born 82, died of thirst in the year 172, creator of the Mob of Deer. Devoted wife, admirer of toads. So right now we're kind of 50-50 on dwarves that died due to not being able to create artifacts and being slain by goblins. And of course, Red Fairface, who just drowned. This is a masterful diorite memorial to Dunbeer. The slab reads, in memory of Dunbeer, born 123, struck down by the goblin Stozu, age maligned with a silver warhammer in Etosp Snostrosp. The Siege of Clouts in the year 172. See? Two sieges in the same year. I mean, that's nuts. Devoted father and husband at one with Lignite, of which we do not have at this fortress. This is an exceptional diorite memorial to Dweezil. In memory of Dweezil, born 77, died of thirst in the year 171. Devoted mother and wife at one with lead. I think Dweezil actually got stuck in a tree. I want to say that Dweezil got stuck in a tree and couldn't get down and died of thirst that way. This is a superior quality diorite memorial to Nenton. It reads, in memory of Nenton, born 77, struck down by the goblin Goso Lobster Hated. That Goso, he was really doing a lot of strike downing. With a silver morning star in Utu Tuxu, the onslaught of barbs in the year 172. 
creator of Covered Molten, lover of shields. Now that's one fun thing. When you play the same world, multiple fortresses, and the dwarves move from one fortress to another, a ton of your dwarves apparently have created artifacts. Like, 30% of the population here has, has created an artifact. Now, much less than that are legendary, because a lot of artifact creation is based on possession. And when you're possessed, you don't get uh, the legendary trait, but still. It's a new year as well. It's 173. It's the midsummer of 173. So we're going to take a look at the, uh, the column, the column or the pillar of the year. Engraved on the wall is an exceptionally designed image of dwarves by Dur. The dwarves are laboring. The artwork relates to the foundation of lost knowledge. Of course, 172 or 166. What am I saying? Okay, next one is a masterful engraving of Oots, Thief Fields, the Goblin, and Jurist Fat Hog Strong Bell, the Berry of Woods. I don't know if we knew this before, but Jurist has earned himself a name. And unfortunately for Jurist, it is the Berry of Woods. <laughs> but, oh boy. Anyway. Jurist is striking down Oots. The artwork relates to the killing of Oots by Jurist, the Berry of Woods, with the Saffron Seal in Lost Knowledge in the Midsummer of 171 during Das Mudetasp, or the Scalded Siege. So not only is Jurist nicknamed the Berry of Woods, the weapon that Jurist uses is named the Saffron Seal. So I think it's safe to say that Jurist is probably one of the more fabulous dwarves. <laughs> at lost knowledge. Engraved on the wall is an exceptionally designed image of Wuthart and a schist table by Dur. Wuthart is raising the schist table. The artwork relates to the masterful schist table created by Wuthart in 172 at lost knowledge. Very relevant. It even got the year right. Engraved on the wall is an exceptionally designed image of Garmet Rocks Donned. A very dwarvy name. I like it. The Dwarf and Stozu Age Maligned the Goblin. Stozu is striking down Garment. The artwork relates to the killing of Garment by Stozu with a silver warhammer in the Siege of Clouts or Etosp Snostrosp. There you have it. There you have it. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So that is Lost Knowledge. We currently are limping along. We now have food. We now have somewhat security, and we're getting to work on the library and assuming I am not tricked and Gregor doesn't decide to get all wear rabbity <laughs> in the middle of our fortress and bring everything tumbling down, I think we should uh, hopefully last long enough to get both our mega, mega, mega project, our tree farm, which will take years, of course, to bear fruit, no pun intended, <laughs> and our library all set up and ready to go, and also our temple, which I still have to gussy up a little bit. I'm thinking golden statues. But I'm talking a big game with this gold, but we don't really actually have that much gold. So I don't know if I'm going to be able to make golden bookcases and tables and statues. I don't think we have as much gold as I'm banking on here. So, but once again, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Marcus Aurelius. This is Dwarf Fortress. I'd like to thank you very much for watching the chaotic and horrific lifestyle of the dwarves of Lost Knowledge. I have to say, based on all the fortresses I've done so far, this one is definitely the one where where loss of dwarven life is highest and just crazy random things tend to happen. But from what I understand, people like that. So there you have it. Thanks a lot for watching. Have a good one.